and welcome to this episode of Authentic Achievements, where I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the fabulous Tara Halliday. Tara, welcome. Thank you very much, Kim. Delighted to be here. Oh, I'm so, so excited to have you on and so looking forward to our conversation, which I know we always get really stuck in and carried away. So before we do that, I'm going to just share a little bit more about you with our audience who haven't had the pleasure of knowing you like I do. So Tara is a world-class imposter syndrome coach. She guides high-achieving leaders to eliminate imposter syndrome and develop energy, focus, calm, resilience, and effortless confidence. Tara brings a practical and scientific approach to helping high performers reach their highest potential. She has over 20 years experience as a qualified holistic therapist. She's a certified coach and a certified neurofeedback trainer and has a PhD in engineering. She's the author of Amazon number one bestsellers, Unmasking, The Coach's Guide to Imposter Syndrome from 2018 and Outsmart Imposter Syndrome in 2023. Her mission and passion are to free high achievers and leaders from unnecessary internal suffering so they can live a happy, meaningful and successful life. Wow, what, what an amazing um, call for of calling for your life to, to be able to help. Because when we're in the throes of, of imposter syndrome, it's it's debilitating, isn't it? We we can uh, we can get ourselves into into such trouble. But before we dig into that, can you share with us a little bit more about your journey? Because that's a fascinating route that you've been on, engineering through to uh, author. You know, it, it it seems odd. I think there's a there's a step before it, and I think that's that's where the difference is. When I was a teenager, and people, you know, careers counselors were saying, "Well, what you, what would you like to do?" I wanted to be a psychologist. My family didn't want me to be a psychologist. They said, "You've got to do something, um, you know, be a computer systems analyst." Okay, and I got into engineering because I could. You know, I liked science yeah. and I could. And I had a ten year career in engineering and the PhD as you mentioned before I finally escaped back to what I really really wanted to do and that was the the the, the therapy so that was my my first that was uh, started in the year 2000 actually it's 20 24 years ago now yeah wow. so and and from there everything's just narrowed um so I was working as a therapist with all sorts of all sorts of clients with all sorts of you know stressful situations and most of them it helped some people kept coming back uh, oh no that's not the point <laughs> you know, i'm not meant to be a crutch right i'm supposed to be a, a catalyst to help so uh, i started digging into why you know why why did they keep coming back and you know i eventually got to that it was about the beliefs they were holding mm -hmm. and okay now maybe i can put that more into my work i found this incredible um framework and coaching practice around unconditional worth which is has been identified as the root cause of all human suffering right there's mm -hmm. when it's conditional so unconditional worth trained in that and then as i was working with clients in that one of my clients said is this imposter syndrome and i said i don't know i haven't heard of imposter syndrome so I, of course i googled it looked it up and and i saw that all the symptoms of conditional worth the stuff that makes us suffer is exactly the same as the symptoms of imposter syndrome mm -hmm. uh, so that was my big light bulb moment mm -hmm. oh my gosh i can see there we've got the root cause of imposter syndrome so this is why it's so hard to address imposter syndrome because people are trying to look at the symptoms and and, and solve that but mm -hmm. i it's it's the root cause. So I just got narrower and narrower my focus. So now I've been working exclusively with people with imposter syndrome uh, for the last eight eight years, I think. Eight years, yes. Wow. Because I think I mean it comes up for so many people, doesn't it? And like you say, it's back to that. Um, you know, I, I always call it like kind of that my personal operating system. So yeah, you know, we, we kind of create that at seven, I think, and we um enforce it at 14 and we embed it at 21 and if we don't go back and look at it it inadvertently drives the rest of our life and, and the rest of our choices and you I, I love that time scale you know what's in, what's interesting is that the belief that that the belief that your worth is conditional gets developed between the ages of 18 months and three years old so oh, yeah precedes and all the rest of our framework so it means that framework that we're developing our operating system at the age of seven 
already had this idea embedded, this belief embedded in it, and ca and you know follows it. And that's why it's again something that unless you know what it is and you know how to shift it, it, it it's not going to move because it's it's rock solid in there. That's it. And, and it's it's not conscious, is it? It's in our subconscious. So we're, we're not aware of it. And for, and for me, you know, I, I liken it these days. It's taken me a long time to get there. But I liken it these days to, you know, I'm 51. So if I think that operating system got finalised at 21, it's 30 years old. That's 30 years worth of bugs and, yeah. and misinformation. And you wouldn't let your phone or your computer run on such outdated software. So why do we not go back and, and kind of update our own personal operating system? So like you, you know, I've spent the last probably you know, seven or eight years really digging into, for me, mine started with why am I doing to myself what I'm doing to myself? Why, you know, why have I developed this belief system? And, and actually, unless I unpick it um, and create a better one, I'm going to inadvertently create scarlets in the same flawed manner that I've created my own. Um, and so for me, that was my driver, was I, if I can understand and update mine, I can learn from that what I can do for her to make sure that uh, she's um, seven now, to make yeah. sure that actually we're building her the very best operating system that we possibly can. I, I love that. And, and, you know, I, I do often get asked, um, you know, by people they hear about imposter syndrome, which for those who don't know is the secret feeling of being a fraud when you're not a fraud and the fear of, of being found out. So it's you, you, you don't really connect with and access your success. Um, so when when people realize that imposter syndrome is prevalent in their life, they realize that they're modeling it for their children. Mm. And so the next thing they they do is they say, okay, can you fix my kids? Can you make sure they <laughs> And it, it, it's very natural. Yes, of course you want to do that. But I will take a step back. The way to influence your child is to be a different role model. So you get rid of imposter syndrome and then your child is not going to have it either. And that's that's the way through. So there's no there's no skipping the parents. <laughs> no, I and mean, one of the things I do with, with Scarlett is um is make sure that yeah i'm i'm kind of re reminding her of the belief piece and when i catch her in one of those moments you know they come they really come back and, and children are as quite um fatalistic often things like, like you come back and, oh i can't color you know it's like mm -hmm. oh, let's, let's just have a look at that so let's have a look at how much better was your coloring today than yesterday oh it was Actually, mummy, it's better. Okay. And how much better was your colouring yesterday than this one from last year? Oh, mummy, it's much better. How do you feel about colouring now? I'm getting good at it, aren't I? I think so. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, kind of make the make the steps, but just mm -hmm. pointers to go, well, let's just anchor it back into how far you've come, but let you do that. Let's because it's got to be your thinking, your decision, where you come from, hasn't it? For us to Really, really want that to fix what you can't do is, is go it, and it, it try and dis, distance her from the label it's like you know you're not naughty you might have made a naughty choice but the beauty of choice is the minute you do one the minute you make a choice that doesn't serve you you can make a brand new choice <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, we're not stuck with it and i think yeah. i'm hoping that some of those will help her to have the inner resilience to become her own best friend rather than become her own worst enemy and having spent probably nearly 40 odd years of my life being my own worst enemy it's not a nice place to be is it you know and you do wish so much so much better for your for your kids um and i would say that it's also your worth as in adults we are worth yeah having our own happier lives and not being driven by this belief i mean the you you hinted at it there that the the conditional worth is belief is the way the belief that um who you are means uh, sorry what you do means who you are so you mm. do something good you are good you do something bad you are bad mm. and that is why you know that, that has been identified back in the 1950s as the the root cause of of, of all human suffering uh, back mm -hmm. then we didn't know we could change we didn't know that, that we had the brain had neuroplasticity we could change beliefs we didn't know any of that neuroscience has moved on and now we know 
if we do things in a very specific way, we can work with our brain the way the brain actually, uh, the, the, the hardware of the brain, if you like, yeah. um, work with that and actually change these beliefs on a very permanent basis. And that's and that for me, it's so powerful. And that's why I'm, you know, so excited about the work that I do, you know, eight years okay. in and I'm still like it. Imagine, I mean, I, um, I knew for me it was life changing once I realized I could change the beliefs that didn't serve me. Um, and you know, I, I do get to do a little bit of that with, with clients, you know, although I do a very different thing to you, it, it crops in. You, know, you suddenly get there and go, oh, okay. So actually, the, the issue is you don't feel worthy, you don't feel like you should be doing this, and that's what's yeah. causing all of these symptoms. To crop up in why you're procrastinating in your business or why you're not making the tough calls when you need to or why you're not taking enough risk or you know it, it kind of drives a, a lot of what comes out in in kind of that business growth piece but it's it is fascinating isn't it what we do to ourselves and how how plausible that voice is i think for me that was the you know that was the real kicker was when I had to own up um, that I was the thing that had got in my way all mm. of this, um, and take take some accountability for that and and then change it. Um, because other than that, until then, I hadn't actually regained control of not only my worth but my power mm. um, because I was still uh, still being you know a, a victim to to what had gone on and. And now I look at it and go, I'm, I'm not a victim of my circumstance. I'm a product of my choice because in every circumstance, I have a choice. Yeah. I may not have many choices, but I have a choice. <laughs> um, and if I take control of that choice and, and do the one that works best, um, then it, it helps you to start to um, rewrite rewrite your, the future, doesn't it? It's like, you know, we are all the author of our own lives and sometimes we need to take back the pen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love what you said about um, the the, um, uh, the the rewriting yeah. and the responsibility. Like, I am responsible for my choices. I think one of the things where areas we can be a bit more gentle with ourselves and say, uh, and that original belief is not our fault. Yeah, like yeah, all of us, all of society teaches us this that your worth depends on what you do. You know, you see, we, we've recently had the Olympics, and of course, you know, some people were dissatisfied with silver, right? Yeah. As if it made them a bad person, then it doesn't make you a bad person, right? You know, it, it, all, all of that, but it's so prevalent in society. The very first step in change is recognizing it. So, we talked earlier about it being yeah. an unconscious belief when we become aware of it when you suddenly realize what's going on and you know all of society has kind of misled you then you, you know it's not something to beat yourself up for it's something to notice and when you notice it then you can do well if you know you, there's something you can do about it then you can act and you can change it and that is the most empowering position to be in when you're when you're changing what you've always been taught and that, as you say, doesn't serve you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, there's so many, I was talking about this on a recent podcast, actually, there, there's so many phrases that I grew up with that actually are just wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, things like um, sticks and stones will break our bones, but names will never hurt us. And yet now we now we understand the power of the brain. We know yes. just the impact that what we say to ourselves and others can have. Uh, and one of my, you know, my favourites was, You've made your bed, you've got to lie in it. Well, it's your bed, get out and make it again. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to stick with that choice for life, you can yeah. make the choice. Um, and I think, you know, like you say, there's a lot of the, of the societal pressures that allow us to feel like things are conditional. It's like I know with, with Scarlett, if I ever have to tell her off about something, I always remind her that you, you remember, all oh, I love you always. I might not like what you've done and we might need to deal with the consequences of that, but I love you always. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I, when I grew up, I grew up in, incorrectly having created a belief that love was conditional on me being perfect. Yes, and That was my childlike view of, of kind of, uh, of the world. 
Um, whereas now I realise the love's unconditional. That doesn't mean to say you're never going to get told off or held to account for making choices that aren't appropriate. Yeah. But, so with Scully, I try and make sure I always reinforce. I love you always. Yes. I don't like this. <laughs> we need to do something different. Let me explain why I don't like this, or you know, it's going to harm you, or you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but so that hopefully she she doesn't ever make one attached to the other yes. um, and then have to go back and unpick it all like I did uh, later on in life because we, we do don't we? we we find we live a label um yeah. to label everything and <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know yeah. what it is and I'm not on my own because everybody else has got a label like it and right. that can be really beneficial but it can also be really harmful can't it we, yeah, you were talking about the operating system that we install by the age of seven. Well, uh, you know, a lot of that is the, the brain mapping out what everything means and yeah. gives a label to everything. And, it, you know, it, children around that age, they're all they're asking for labels. You know, tell me how I'm different from my siblings. <laughs> tell me how, you, you know, tell me what are my qualities. You, you, we're, we're trying to define ourselves. It's the brain trying to refine how mm. how to represent the world. Yeah. So it's it's a very um, I, I, what I'm keen with, with the people that I work with is, is, is that they don't feel like it's their fault. Like it's yeah. not. It's not not to blame and it's not their parents fault so we're not going to therapy and blaming parents here because their parents were taught the same thing mm -hmm. how how would they know i mean it's like learning another language if your parents never learned it and you never learned it anywhere else in your environment how, how can you expect to know what you know that language right yeah. only by oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> that broadly near somebody <laughs> oh, listen i was a genius and yeah. And it is, it's the, you know, I sometimes find when, when I'm chatting to chatting to my mum, and she said, oh, I've not thought of it that way. And she went, well, I didn't do that. And I went, no, but, but you didn't study it either. You know, <laughs> I've spent years studying it. So I know it purely because I got taught it. Yes. You get taught it, to your point, Tara, you get taught it. How on earth are you possibly ever supposed to know? Exactly. Um, and so we're just doing the, you know, the best that we can with the hand that we've been dealt and each generation is trying to fix the bit they learned mm -hmm. we something on the journey don't we and we go ah, oh, i'm not going to do that bit with mine <laughs> it's with mine i'm not going to do that bit with mine and um, but before we go inward and i think for me that was my that was one of my hardest things to do was to go in because mm -hmm. i didn't like myself very much so going inward and spending more time w was a terrifying thought It'd be much better <laughs> to be out here with all these lovely people <laughs> that, that were imperfect. Um, but actually, I realised I'd got to go in and and understand how I viewed myself because mm -hmm. that was the only place I was going to change. Because um, it didn't matter how many external accolades you got or awards you won or anything else, because that wasn't changing the voice inside. Um, because you'd still say things like, you know, I would still say, well, if only they knew. <laughs> they knew. They knew what I knew, then they, then they wouldn't be doing this. And, and for me, one of my big breakthrough moments was, um, I remember suddenly hearing myself saying that, well, if only they knew this. And then I thought, hold on a minute. So these people that you really admire, that you aspire to be like, that you, you know, that you would love to be a tenth as, as good as, are telling you that you're really good at, at this particular thing. And you're convinced that your opinion that you're wrong, that they're so your opinion that they're wrong is better and more valid than their opinion that they're right. Yeah. That makes no sense because I don't I don't think my opinion is worth anything to be fair. <laughs> but at the time, so why on earth would I dismiss their opinion that I aspire to be like and cling on to my own? That makes that makes no sense. Right. Um, and so my start of my journey was I started borrowing their opinion. I go, well, you know, I, if they believe I can do it, I'm going to borrow their belief, do my best not to prove them wrong. It's like, <laughs> and that helped me on the start of, of that journey until I realised it takes you so far. And actually what you've got to go is the next bit is to go inward and go, how do I change that belief? How do I dismantle that table? Because our in my head, how our belief system works is we, we have a belief and then every time 
something else happens, it becomes another leg on the table yeah. of belief until we've got the most stable table we're ever going to have. Yeah. Um, and we think that's never going to move because it's like it's rock solid. But what we have to do is create a new table over here, don't we? <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> let's move them over. Um, and for me, that that was that it, that felt very daunting, but it was also so liberating when yeah. she had done it. Once she'd gone back and 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 kind of looked at it from a different angle, been a bit yeah. more curious about why am I so convinced I'm right? Why am I so convinced that's wrong? What what can what else might be playing into this that I've not considered or I've not um, reflected on? That's such a, such a powerful process to go through. I, I, I think the the difficulty with that process is also is was always well how how do I how do I do this how do I change this belief and you know it feels like you know it's like how long's a piece of string it feels like it's either never ending or it feels like it's, it's just too far open and ended you've no idea even where to start and that's that that exact point was the reason that I developed my. Um, in a success program, which is, is a very structured program. There's eight steps. We go step by step. There's exercises to do each one. And, and each one, we're systematically dismantling the old belief, taking down the old legs and yeah. building in ones that actually genuinely s support it. And all the while using, you know, neuroscience and how the brain works as, as, as our guide to how to do this. So it goes from being something nebulous and and a bit scary you know to go in and redefine yourself like you say it's very some some people find it very uncomfortable to do um but when you have a process and you can just follow the steps in the process oh then it's it's so much easier and and it's and it's so much more because you know the steps are backed up by science it's reproducible so you get the same result time after time after time now i focus solely on one belief so I'm not rewriting personalities or anything like that and, and that's and that's not the point of it at all um, but th this this one belief is one of these uh, cornerstones to it's probably the imposter syndrome is probably the biggest block to success there is it's, in fact it's over 70 percent of mm -hmm. high at some point in their careers and uh, you know some studies say even more than that yeah and, and I think um, I, I read similar. I read that actually seventy percent of us globally at any one point um, will suffer a little bit yeah. of imposter syndrome. And you know, always, you know, it's always good to know that you're in good company. So you know, for me, the fact that you know Einstein had it. Uh, so yeah. he had a quote which I'm going to butcher. Um, so forgive me, but something along the lines of um, the esteem within which my works are held leave me feeling like an, unli an unlikely swindler and um, so even Einstein yes. expected as a yes. um, and people that you wouldn't expect so both Eminem and Justin Bieber have got songs where they talk about imposter yes. and then you know, so even people that are outwardly super confident and, and look like they never doubt themselves for a second yeah doesn't matter how confident we look externally it can still be eaten us up inside can't it Yes, yes, and 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 it can lead to burnout, people destroying careers. I, you know, it, it's it's a serious, it's a very very stressful, and very serious issue, and and you can't out succeed imposter syndrome. There's always the idea that oh well, if I just get to the next level, then I'll start feeling good about myself. All right, if I get to the next. <clears throat> landmark in whatever I put then maybe I'll feel better so this is where people get driven to achieve more and more and more and more and they never get there and this is why you know Einstein at the top of their field those singers at the top of their field um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um you know actors at the top of their fields I, I, every in every industry in every area of achievement um you you can't outrun this because it's a it's a belief. It's an internal belief. Well, it's, with, it's in you, isn't it? It's in, that's why you've got to go inward to it. So it's like no matter what changes outwardly, inwardly you're still there. Right. You're still going. You're still turning up. To <laughs> <laughs> Wherever and, you go, there you are. Yes. That's it. You, know, you, can't, you can't outrun yourself. I think for me yeah. that was my breakthrough moment, which is you know, I'm going to be with me 
for the rest of my life. So either I start to learn to like myself or I'm going to be pretty darn miserable <laughs> in those moments of solitude uh, mm-hmm. because you're with somebody you don't want to spend any time with. And that's a bit, that's a bit sad. Um, it, it is. And people think that, that if they go inward, they might discover that they really aren't worthwhile and they really aren't good enough and it's gonna it's gonna have to somehow prove it gonna prove that so they'd rather not go there and um and i've worked with a lot of executives and i can guarantee that there is nobody who's ever found that <laughs> because because it's a false premise so you, you know it, it's you, you're not going to 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 find the, the truth of a false premise no and it, i think that I love that because we we also we believe the things we say about ourselves and we don't we, we believe other people think them too. So you know, I, I know for, for many years, you know, I would externalize my awful things I said about myself and go, well, they might think this or they'll think that or think the other or think never asked anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> stupid and ask anybody. Um, and then I was given an exercise where I had to go and ask people, um, friends, family, and colleagues as part of my development. Uh, and say, I really need you to be honest. I really want to work on, on developing myself. Could you tell me one or two things that you think are my strengths and one or two things where you think I'd get in my own way? Um, and when the feedback came back, it was almost unanimous. My strengths were brave and fearless. And I was like, I don't really get that. I live in fear every minute of every day, fear that I'm going to be found out, fear that people are going to realise that I'm just a hairdresser and I shouldn't be here really. I shouldn't be doing these things or whatever, you know, script was going on in my head. Um, and so I said, I said could, you, could you just help me? I don't get it. Could you just explain in a bit more detail? Um, and, and they were like, Kim, you will literally up sticks and move somewhere where you know nobody. Yeah. For a job you're not 100% convinced you can do. And I was like, mm-hmm. And they said, well, we think that's brave and fearless. And I'm interesting. <laughs> I thought you all thought I was flighty and a little bit stupid. <laughs> but so I think my life on the fact that's what you think of me, where in reality I have to own up and go, that's what I think of me. Yeah. Um, and therefore the opinion I need to change is in here. Uh, and it's therefore chasing the, I used to be like a course junkie. I've got more, more certificates and qualifications mm-hmm. than, uh, yeah, than I know what to do with. Um, because I was like, well, if I could just learn one more thing, if I could just learn one more thing, if we just, then that would be okay. Um, but it was never okay because I wasn't changing that belief that was following me wherever I went. I was just um, plastering the cracks with another certification. <laughs> well, it, it's that stretch. I mean, that 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 never have it feeling like you quite have enough qualifications qualifications in particular sometimes it's you know money or possessions but often it's qualifications um that's a classic symptom of imposter syndrome yeah and and, and you're, you're absolutely right you know you can have this great long list and it will never it will never prove to yourself that yeah. you're good enough it, 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 it cannot and but it, you still have this urge well if i just got one more maybe that i so, so this is you just repeating the, the same solution over and over and, and hope that it an imposter syndrome will go away eventually and yeah. that as a strategy not bad in, in, in other areas of life but in terms of imposter syndrome it, it, it will never solve the problem so no. uh, that's the unfortunate part of it but when you realize that and you realize oh this urge that I have to, to get another course is a symptom of stress. Yeah. Right? It is me trying to find a solution to the stress that I'm under. When you realize that's it, it's like, okay, so it's really not about the course at all. It's for me, I'm under massive stress and I'm desperate to find a solution. Ah, now you say, you know, choices. Now, now you can go, now you can open up what your options are because you know what the real problem is. And the real problem isn't just getting another course certificate. Yeah, I love that. Because very often in life, as you pointed out so eloquently earlier on, so often in life we're busy fixing symptoms instead of understanding what the cause is. Yeah. And then all that happens is they pop up somewhere else. <laughs> like, Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so which I think it is it's, it's that it's that understanding first that um that there is a it's your belief system that needs an upgrade and and you know, for me the reason I always use that language of it's you know a system that uses an upgrade nobody builds a system expecting it to be flawed 
Nobody wants it to be flawed. Nobody purposefully puts the bugs in there. They're there because they did the best that they could with the information at the time. And therefore, when we go and do an upgrade and we start fixing those bugs, there's no blame to be attached to yeah. any of those, either from the original developer or from uh, or from the operator themselves. Because yeah. there weren't, it wasn't the intention that they turned up. It was the impact that they're there. It's the impact we've got to deal with. Mm -hmm. But the intention was always honourable. The intention yeah. was always to do the right thing. And, and for me, that's helped me to... To go and address those bits where you go, well, I don't want to, I don't really want to go down that route because what if that means I'm ending up saying it was my family's fault or it was somebody else's? And I don't believe that, you know, I don't believe that. I don't want to believe that either. Um, once I realized that's not the case, what you're saying is that everyone did the best they could with the information they knew at the time. We now have better information. Mm -hmm. We can upgrade it um, and make it work for us. That became something that you were, that I was much more able to embrace wholeheartedly because it didn't come with guilt either of self or of loved ones yes and I think that's so important that 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 not blaming right there's there is there is an, in, an innocence to this belief we took it on as innocent children and we didn't know our parents taught us as innocent because they were never taught and their and their parents you know it, it goes it goes all the way back and yeah. I don't I don't even know how far back it goes. I don't think we can even say because it, it's it's pervasive. Um, yeah. it, unless we're specifically taught to separate out our actions from our worth, then the default that the vast majority of humans have is that they're the same. And yeah. that's and that's the problem <laughs> right there. But it's no, you're right, nobody's fault. There's no to blame. And if you go in with that, then it's easier to to walk through this journey because you know that it's not going to condemn you or, or blame anyone else. I love that. Um, I could chat to you all day. But <laughs> You've already shared some amazing insight. Could you could you end before you let people know how to get in touch with you? Um, with what's the one thing that if you could go back and give your younger self some advice, what would you what would it be? You know what? There's there's this lovely. Um, song there's a there's a there's a band called hill song and they've got this song called dear younger me and it's exactly that if i went if i knew them what i know now you know what what would i tell myself and their words were it's not your fault um, and, and and for me that's a very very powerful statement i mean is it uh, i'd probably elaborate a bit more right that you have this belief that your worth depends on who you are but it doesn't. When you were born, you were an absolute miracle, right? You didn't need to do anything. You didn't need to earn anybody's a favor or anything like that. You, you, you were totally lovable, totally worthy. And nothing's changed. You, yeah. as a human being, you are still that person. And what you do can never affect it. And that that would set me that would have set me free and that's that mm -hmm. is that that sets everyone free when they when they get to that oh I love that and I, I must admit my little girl poor soul um is literally the spitting image of me when I was the same age in fact she saw a picture the other day and she went mummy it's me and I was like I never dressed you like that <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing some awful, awful 1970s outfit and I was like just no, really no. No. But for me, that makes it much easier because when I look at her and I see her near pictures of me, it's like it is like talking to your younger self. No, yeah. I wish I knew then. I can hope to share with her now and go, right? Don't like, don't believe <laughs> response. You know, I wish I knew that. Um, we are always enough, and there's nothing we can't do if we're willing to try. Yeah. Um, and it, it so I, I love that. I, I know you're right. It would set set you free. So <laughs> how may, how can people get in touch with you? Um, what do they get in touch with you about? Right. Okay. Well, so so the work that I do is one to one work with with business owners, leaders, executives, and take them through a one to one my specific program called Inner Success to get rid of imposter syndrome and you know jumpstart them. Um, so that's that's the work that I do. What I'm doing right now is I'm a, I'm actually doing a research project. So I've I've got this. Fantastic program, if I can say that myself, with all modesty, it gets amazing results. In fact, it gets 
be better results than any other published approach to imposter syndrome. So I'm very proud of it. Um, so I've worked with people and I've trained another coach to, to work with people and they all get consistently excellent results. I've been challenged now, say, okay, is this just because you're a brilliant coach? <laughs> is this, you know, I need to prove that it's reproducible with the same system with any facilitator. So I'm training up 30 coaches to facilitate my program. And for those coaches, I need case study clients. And the case study clients, they'll still get one-to-one -one and I'll be supervising them. They're experienced coaches. So they, they, get, they get the whole um, inner success transformation that, that's doing so well. Um, but because it's research, I'm trying to make it as cheap as possible. So it's really, really cheap. It's it's £975 plus fat, which is 13% of what an executive would pay. It's very small. So this is starting. Um, uh, the doors open on the 1st of September. So we're very close. Um, and uh, um, we'll be starting the actual program in, in, in the middle of October. So if you're over 33 this is the research program that's demographic so if you're over 33 and you're in a leadership business owner managerial role and you want to get rid of imposter syndrome then if you go to my website which is outsmartimpostorsyndrome.com go to my website and you can click on that and take a look at the details and see if it's right for you and we were talking about being aware and then taking action. So this is the taking action part of it. Perfect. And I will make sure in the show notes below, um, that we'll have all of the ways to contact um, Tara and also a link to that case study group uh, and all the social media. Tara, okay. it's been a joy as always. Thank you so very much for coming on and sharing such wisdom and insight into something that affects so many people. So thank you so much. Absolute pleasure, Kim. This has been great and a brilliant conversation with you, I have to say. It's been fun. Bless you. Thank you so much. And for everybody watching and listening, until next time, take care.